everyone. Um, very good to see you here. Um, I'm Dr. Kim Dismont Robinson, and I am the Folk Life Officer for the Department of Community and Cultural Affairs. And this is the very first uh, uh, lecture for our Historical Heartbeats uh, lecture series for 2011-2012. So very good to see such a fabulous turnout today. I'm not at all surprised because this one it's great fun. Um, I'm very happy <laughs> idea. To, uh, idea. to introduce a man who needs no introduction, I think, but I'm going to introduce him anyway. I think you all know Tom Watson, who has been really at the forefront of sustainable agriculture and farming here in Bermuda for quite some time now and has um, been duly recognized, I think, as being that person, being the one. I just that. need some more recognition. You know, light blue pieces of paper, <laughs> signatures in the corner. Absolutely. <laughs> And um, if I recall, you began with um, conventional farming in 1974? 76. Right? 76, okay. And, um, and later changed well, over to organic. Yeah. Well, we felt forced to, yes. So yeah. let, them, let, let her rip, right? All there right, we go. sounds good. So, good afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> okay, here we are. Wired for sound. Okay, yeah, so as Kim says, yeah, my name's still Tom Watson. And um, yeah, I've been doing this since 1976 as, as she did also mention um, we were conventional farmers like any everybody else. Um, organic was not trendy at all then. And um, then you, you get further down the road, you watch things happening on crops. You watch, you know, you, you, it's not going well. You can, you can see that. You know, the stuff is you having to fire more fertilizer and anything. This, so up goes your salt levels and it just gets worse and worse and worse. And then you start people getting people in your family who are dying of cancer. This is not good. So you know this is a basically a flawed system out there. And you don't really realize how flawed it is in, until you sort of live it. So I, um, I had the privilege of a garden, skip, uh, garden club scholarship and went to the Ontario Agricultural College in Guelph and took the, um, the how to diploma in agriculture as opposed to the how you know the why to degree in agriculture so anyway I was in and out of there in a heartbeat and um, it's probably historical at this point <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and, um, and, and yes sorry quick interruption is there anybody by show of hands who's vegetarian or vegan in a Bermuda that was very rural uh, I also had the extreme privilege of working for a man by the name of Thomas James, his son, a lot of you probably know his son, Tommy, who was a vet. And Thomas James was an interesting man. He's a Welshman, he's a hard guy, hard guy. And Thomas James was the, was the 40 man. He had 40 men working for him. He worked 40 acres of land, he milked 40 cows, and he had more than 40,000 chickens. And, uh, and, and anyway, so he was a very diverse operation. So we had engaged in, in, um, in you know, just, we were jogging along. I had a couple of guys working with me, and as, as I say, you know, chemicals were what was happening. Then it went on and on and on, and then you started becoming disenchanted with it, and you wonder how to change. It's very simple. You get a weather event like Fabian, and your slate is completely cleaned in 12 hours. Okay? <laughs> completely clean. I'm talking cassava was gone, everything was gone. Bananas, that hole out there was all gone, gone. Check you later. And um, so we were then called down to the government. And they asked us to give an estimate of our losses, and you could give them any number you want, because you weren't even getting a glass of ice water. How you like Bermuda now? And um, <laughs> so, anyhow, I should have taken this with me, get some action. So, um, so we were absolutely wiped out with Fabian. So that was okay. Well, here we go. So it was it was astounding, in that, um, for example, this operation behind us is um, Bermuda Gardens, and they had a lot of they have all these plastic houses. They, they grow tomatoes and cucumbers. That's it. And so they had all this smashed up lumber. So I had a Canadian guy working for him. He didn't like to go to the lumber yard, but he'd spend, you know, 40, 40 hours straightening out a two by four. Anyway, we built all these pens and, um, and got rolling in a very rudimentary form of pasture poultry. We started, um, and the pasture poultry being a system that we em employ to this day, we harvest 100 chickens a week every week and more for special events and other poultry as well. But the basic theory on pasture poultry is you have three components to that system. One is broiler chickens, which is a Cornish cross. It's the same industry standard that everybody else has used. I've tried others. Um, they do extremely well here. 
And what they do, we keep them in a, in a they, we used to call them pens, now we call them shelters. Right? You know, it's all very trendy now, right? And uh, yeah, we used to kill stuff, now we harvest it. And uh, <laughs> you know, you know. And uh, anyway, so we get going with these pens, and basically the, the, it's based on a model um, developed by a guy called Joel Salatin. You may know, may have heard of Joel. He was the good guy in food, and he also serves, um, I don't know, apparently, I don't know much in Bermuda, but when I go to the States, I'm the president, the vice, vice president of the American Pastor Poultry Producers Association, but I don't do jack about chickens around here, right? But not to worry. Um, and Joe is on our board of directors. He's our member at large, and he is the guy who really started uh, quantifying pasture poultry and really got it going. He's probably one of the most defiant farmers out there, which is, you know, rings a good, good bell with me. I like all that. And um, Joe's the guy in Food Inc. who'll say, you know, just, oh, he just tells him, forget about it. In fact, his late, one of his more recent books was Everything I Want to Do is Illegal, right? That's, that's right up there with up here, you know? <laughs> yeah, you know, like they want to, you know, you don't have enough whatever. It's, anyway, Joe is a good man. So he set this whole thing up. His, um, so it comprises of two types of chickens, meat chickens and, uh, and laying chickens. The meat chickens, you will not see one of these meat chickens or any of their turkeys applying for a PhD at Harvard. Therefore, we keep them in 10 by 12 shelters, no longer pens, and they're, um, they're cool. Uh, two thirds of it is roofed. Um, we actually put a back and some short sides on them because we're working in wind all the time. And these pens are moved every day. So you've got 100 birds doing their thing, eating, drinking, and doing something else in a 10 by 12 area. So that way you get a very regular lay down of manure. But you've got manure still, and you're working in, in a very, uh, you know, it's pretty, basically pretty urban wherever you go, most of the places around here. So the next problem you're gonna have is flies. That's why you let the layer chickens go out with them. The layer chickens are pretty smart. They know how to forage. Um, and we've, we've done some interesting work with them. We, at one point, we were forced to buy a load of, um, of ready-to-lay pullets, which are sort of 18-week-old birds ready to go. And, but they have clipped beaks. They clip their beaks on them so they don't, could cannibals, uh, their chickens are pretty cannibalistic. And they do this because most of them are in these confined things. It was astounding. We put them out in the pasture, the ones with real beaks and the ones with clipped beaks. The, the ones with clipped beaks could not harvest grass. It was, it was so, that was a hard lesson learned there, but we got a few eggs out of them. But, um, so these guys will then come behind the broiler chickens. They will scratch. There is manure. You've got sun. You've got rain. And they clean out every fly, lar piece of fly larvae there is. There are no flies. They scratch it in, they work it out, okay? Now, there's another issue. When we move these birds out, we get them as day-olds. We, actually, I've got the incubator room right in there. That's um, running right now, but we're just doing turkeys and some geese in there right now. But we were hatching, we were trying to do a shipment of birds once a month, like a couple hundred, and then try and incubate them. It was very inconsistent, because you have to buy the eggs from the hatchery. There's like four guys in America producing the hatcheries for all this stock. They've got the patents on it and all, you know, all this sort of stuff. And the poultry industry in North America is just thrilled. There's not one poultry department left in any of the land run universities now. That's how much they've mashed that up, right? Anyway, not to worry. So I use sheep in this system as well. The sheep, because the birds when they grow out, they're about three weeks old. The biggest one I had yesterday was about that big. You can't put them out in three foot high grass. So the sheep keep the lawn mode. The chickens supply the manure. The layers scratch through it. And that's the fundamental basis of that. Now you do that for a little while and your soil fertility goes from zero to a million. Like it's just, it's profound. To the point where one of the biggest issues that we have um, in, in Bermuda are fungal diseases. We don't get them in our strawberries anymore. We simply do not get them. Most commercial growers are spraying berries every five days with some pretty nasty stuff. We did two biologicals last year. Probably not gonna do any this year because we've got about 100 plants left out of 25,000 after those two gales. This is actually the second year in a row that our strawberries have failed. So um, we're reconsidering all of that. Okay, so we get going with that. So you got, you got the animals out there doing their thing. Then of course you can't just keep it simple like that. So you end up, um, People come and see me like this one guy called Don Bixby, who was here on a, um, he, he was great. He comes and introduces himself to me at the market in town. And he says he'd like to have a word when he says, Papa, the mine's not shut yet. I got to keep going for another hour. I says, well, I'll check you Monday. He comes up here and out of his pocket, he produces 
about half a dozen internet downloads of these really odd looking pigs, which are referred to as an Asaba hog, which are the ex identical genetics, same strain of pigs that came out with Wanda Bermudez and all these guys. And they're on this one island, Asaba Island, which is off Savannah, Georgia. That's the only population that never got tainted. And uh, Jessica Cox, I was talking to her about it one day, and she said, yeah, I've been down there. <laughs> I said, oh, really? He said, yeah, yeah. Well, that Humphreys cry from Paget and the island, they only gave it up a couple of years ago, which they didn't. That was absolutely correct. The Humphreys family kept records on these pigs for 350 years. And so I got stock straight out of there, which I thought was, you know, that all happened. Um, basically, we started on that in, in 2007, and then we bred them because I wanted locally bred ones for uh, our 400th anniversary. So, um, we ended up setting up this display. Nobody knew that we had them or anything, da, 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 except my mate Don. He did, Don Bixby didn't even know I'd, I'd had them. He's done a, so I sent him a thing, oh, by the way, I got the pigs. And he says, um, anyway, he's since then done all his DNA work on these pigs, and they were, they were originally thought to have come straight out of Iberian Spain. Wrong. They definitely went down. If you, I don't know if you guys are familiar with pilot charts and stuff. I sail a little bit too. But if you, um, basically the trades come down the uh, coast of Africa, they, they, these pigs were actually loaded in the Canaries. They figured that out because there's a lot of Asian pig in them. So the Iberian ones were coming down. Then there's a lot of pigs coming out of the east, and that's the ones that were crossbred and sent over here. And so that is, and he's still doing more DNA work on it. And um, very clever man and a fun guy. He's, he's the vet for the American Livestock Breeds Conservancy, which we do a whole pile of work with. So they love us because there's no, we have these pigs genetically isolated from North America. All the other flocks in the States apparently have this virus now. Guess who doesn't? Um, and I then got into a bunch of other stuff with them. And they are very, they, these people basically, they, they may not own them, but they know where all the genetics of, of um, any common, fairly common North American animals where they are if they don't actually have direct access to them. And um, so we ended up getting a bunch of different uh, waterfowl in particular, which we're working on right now. So we've got um, really odd ducks and geese and stuff. Stuff like, um, we have Sebastopol geese, which look like they got like dreadlocks. Um, we've got buff geese, the only geese that are, and these are all on critical lists. Um, buffs, they're, um, they're the only one you can, um, that's been named for its color. You got another, we've got another one called pilgrims. That's an American breed that is the only um, type of uh, goose that can be sexed by color on birth. All the rest of them you got to, <coughs> take a little look for them. And um, a number of other things. So we're doing all this stuff with, with great encouragement from them. They're, they're still missing out on the light blue piece of paper, but you know, not to worry. Um, so we have this huge, now we've got this little thing set up. We're just really, just we moved a lot of the animals in there yesterday, actually. It's, it's been a big work in progress. So we end up now with this land that is so much more fertile. What happens next? You don't need the fertilizers. You, you do, we use, we do two things to side dress with. We use, um, actually we use three things. We now use a pasteurized poultry manure, like we don't have enough chicken stuff out there already. Um, and, and why, they say, well, it's more expensive than buying local stuff. I says, yeah, but it's not as expensive as pulling the weeds out because chicken feed, unless it's pasteurized, or chicken manure, unless it's pasteurized, will carry invariably a lot of, um, pigweed or colorloose seed, and it will carry a lot of stinging nettle seeds for some reason. I don't know where they dig the grain or it encourages it or whatever. So if it's pasteurized, that, that um, eliminates that problem. But the other stuff we use is 1600, which is chili and nitrate. And I don't get why it's approved as, you know, by OMRI, which is the Organic Materials Review Institute, because it's a mined product. It's not like there's, a, there's an everlasting supply of it. It's more mined in Chile. So you used to hear, probably hear of the uh, toll ships and the, um, and the nitrate boats. The nitrate boats that say haul a load of wheat into Australia, or haul a load of wheat out of Australia, and anyway, somehow I end up in Chile hauling nitrate up to wherever it had to go. And the other interest, this is a total sidebar on this whole thing. The other interest, I've got a great question for you. Does anyone know where the word SH1T came from? That's got your attention, doesn't it? Yeah. The yeah, well, exactly. Guana. Then they started hustling guana, right? And they take all these sailors, they'd be out there digging all this guana off some rock in the middle of nowhere. And they load it up. Somebody'd go down with his little oil lamp at about midnight to check the watch. And, you know, just check down there. And the methane, because it got wet, the stuff will 
started making methane and kablam and the ship was never heard of again, right? And um, so they then got clever and they realized that they needed to store this stuff high in transit. That's where it came about, store high in transit. So there's your little tidbit for the day. And um, anyway, so you, but fertility has clearly been a whole thing. So you get into this whole thing now, so you, you're changing gears. You're going back to where we were, say, 50 years ago. There's no more chemical salesmen coming around and, and um, all these people. And so you're going for this natural fertility. So you're using the Chilean nitrate. And then the other thing we use is a, we, um, we represent a company out of North America called Fertrell, and they do a lot of this, this type of stuff. And they've got one which is a 424, which sounds like nothing, 4% nitrogen. Yeah, it sounds like nothing, but it's all slow release. We do literally a bead of this upside the lettuce, and it's just guaranteed green. It's unbelievable. It's, our fertilizer use is probably a tenth of what it was 10 years ago, which is, um, this is huge. Then we work a lot of cover crops, and, um, and David Lopes, was, he, was, he was appalled. He said, you're not going to, for example, we do stuff like a lot of legumes, like cowpeas, working with some buckwheat right, right now. I've never planted buckwheat before. We also do grass, some um, cover crops, stuff like oats in the winter. We'll go mill it in the summer because we need this pasture. Now, there's two things happening on this pasture. <coughs> One is the animals are creating a certain amount of fertility, but if we inoculate these legumes, which is very simple to do, you just go up to the gas station, buy a bottle of Coke, right, and nothing will not stick to it. You know, you, and it, so you just, and that, unless the ants get you, that's another issue. But, um, so you put, you inoculate the stuff, and hey presto, you're fixing nitrogen out of the air, you're getting a huge, it doesn't look like much grass on the top, but you say, take a grass, which is uh, one of our more preferred base pastures, so they call it runny, we call it runny grass here, it's called Bermuda grass in the rest of the world, but it has a huge, huge set of, the roots are all rhizomes underneath, so what you see on top is maybe a tenth of what's going on, on underneath as far as organic material and stuff goes. Then you get a pasture like Bermuda grass, and you can tell we've got a gizmo, and this was I've, when they used to give out environmental grants, I actually got a grant to, um, to work on grasses here, and, and I was really felt quite relieved, because I, I was looking at no-till equipment and stuff to do this, and this stuff was huge, it was massive, it was way too big, then I stumbled across a tiny little thing at six feet wide called a slit seeder. Instead of, it's kind of like a rototiller, but instead of having angled blades, it just has knives in it, then it's got a seed box in the back, some rakes that knock it in, and so we can take a pasture of, say, Bermuda grass, which will, it'll do well, it'll, it, but it'll, it'll sort of show it off. There's other things you can add to it. So probably in another month, we'll be slit seeding millet into some of this thing. Millet is a grass that will grow. You don't even need, not a drop of rain. I swear to God, it's a desert out there. If it hasn't rained for a week or whatever, and that stuff comes up. It's the most, one of the most profound things I've ever seen in my life. So in the summer, and it's extremely drought resistant, we tend to go with either pearl or brown millet now. We used to use a foxtail. Uh, we just found we didn't get the yields on it. So then, so we have, now we have this ability to do these short-term crops within the long-term pasture. And I'm just astounded at the fertility build, it builds. I mean, then you get things like spinach, the stuff will taste different, it tastes good, it's slower grown, it's got a way longer shelf life, it doesn't have all this crap in it, so you know everybody's not running to the health food store for wheatgrass shots or something because you know they've got cancer. So maybe I'm got to figure that out because I'm selling a lot of wheatgrass now. You know, <laughs> it's, it's a hard, hard one to do. So you end up with this thing. You end up with these various enterprises within the farm. Now anybody can have layer chickens. Anybody can have meat chickens. Anybody can have sheep. But once you start working them all together, the balance is the key. You can't, over, you can't overgraze the pasture too much. It's just going to cost you. It, 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 you're, if you, you just can't do that. You know, there's only X amount of grass on that thing. And so you don't expect to get 2X off it, because it's not. So we've now been very fortunate to, and it happened almost 50 years to the day after I first met Thomas James, that I actually got some land that's owned by that family to work. And, and we've made, put a lot of effort into this, into this thing to clean. It was, had been sort of abandoned a bit. And now we actually have a setup up there whereby we have five paddocks, we have 50 mama sheep up there, and we can scoot them around about every 10 days. So, you know, it's, and you've got up to two months to really get, you know, this grass grow. So we're really on to something now. And it's really quite profound because they just have this ability to go through underneath the brush and it just eventually all cleans up. I suppose if I really wanted to clean up, I'd let some pigs go. And, uh, <laughs> and they'll mash it all up.
You know, we had an incident around here. Oh, Mr. Watson, four of your pigs are out. I said, yeah, yeah, there's four. I guess, ma'am, I hate to disappoint you. There's actually 16 that are running around right now. But, <laughs> but and we had one of those the other day. And um, so you get all these things. What we got this time, Miss Kim? This is just drink. Oh, excellent. <laughs> Ice tea. Excellent. OK. Um, so you get all these things. So you got these systems that you, you get rolling. Then the real key here is to tie them together. And so, like I said, you see how the chickens feed off of each other with the sheep and everything else. And then while that's all happening, your land fertility is just skyrocketing. Um, we get into other, say, like, as I was mentioned, some of these cover crops. For example, I had a, almost two acres of cow peas at one point. And I was like, oh, you're getting ready to plow those cow peas down. I said, no, I'm getting ready to fence them. So now, and he, could, he couldn't get it. I said, Bert, they're going to eat the cow peas and all the material still lands in the field. We just got a little bit of a catalyst happening. In, in, in the middle of it. So we're finding this extremely productive. Now, the, probably the bit that really made my day was where I get, I have to bring in a new ram every now and again. That's, and uh, the mark, don't ever rent a rental car from her. I said, your chocolate sheep, the lady at Atlanta gets all excited, right? And I'll give you another point. You could ship, may, you could ship rams, you could carry rams in a kennel in the car, but you won't ship a you, right? Because they do things from different locations, right? Luckily, I had a male sheep. Anyway, this woman was foolish when I showed up with a sheep in the car. But um, we got through that. So, um, so, you, so we, we, that's another thing that we've, um, we have been uh, very lucky with. I wasn't really going to get back into animals. As, as the Browns know, I've had chickens since before Bermuda was discovered almost. But um, so you get all these things going. And you get these cover crops growing, and you get all this stuff going. People don't get it. Very few people, it's, it's really not difficult to, to calculate the value of an acre of grass. How do you do it? It's very simple. You got X amount of lambs on there. They're gaining X amount a day. Lamb is X. You know, see, it's just, that's all it is. It's just these assessments are not rocket science. But all I know is if you can feed, say, 50 lambs and take them from 20 pounds up to 50, you're done all right, you know? And that's all with grass. And incidentally, the, another thing that happens in Bermuda is people all this, they perceive a shortage of forage. And, and ruminants totally live on forage. When I say ruminants, uh, sheep, cattle, that sort of thing, it's all the stomachs. And um, we use sheep, but Joe Salton uses beef. And that's another thing that he discovered. Check this one out. So Joe was a very clever man, very clever thinker. And he was using beef. He figured out that he kept, he would move, he'd strip graze these cows. So basically he has these things, a big trailer that's a, a hen house, and he moves it into a pasture. But he moves, he used to move them before the beef. Now he moves them after. In fact, he moves them in five days after. You know why? Because at five days, and he would only keep those cattle in there for like, for a day. <laughs> five days later, the fly mar larvae are the maximum size, so he gets the max protein. There's your boy, right? People thinking it's all free protein. They figured out in Cuba, that a chicken can lay an egg if it gets one earthworm a day. You know, and, and, and the none of this, you know, this does not come out of, you know, the deepest, darkest bowels of some land grant university, right? This is just people checking it out and paying attention and writing it down. And what we're seeing now in the whole business of agriculture is a lot more of this. It all got supposedly very scientific and all this stuff. And all of the all the little systems and the micro little eco things and all this stuff happening just fell by the wayside. And, and um, now this stuff is all being rediscovered. Um, this, and basically, there's a huge movement in North America to decentralize the food things. You guys realize that the, the North American food system is like basically controlled by four <laughs> major companies, right? It's like Cargill, Kraft, and all these people. And they're brutal. They're brutal. You know? They're in there for one thing, and that's to make money. Now you've got these younger guys coming in. And I'll tell you what, just in APA, the American Pasture Poultry Producers Association, I think we got 700 members now. So that's 700 people. Most of them are Pennsylvania, but we got them all over Canada and Spain and everywhere else. But these are smaller farms that are taking just a much more direct route with the whole thing. That's why we built this shop here. I'm sick and tired of getting stuck at a traffic light in town. And so this, you know, I have no control of the destiny of my food. and. Um, it, it's, that's the whole thing that we're sort of really on about is the fresher you can get the food, the more nutrition is in it, the better it is. Um, 
our plan is to have this, and we're just about there. It's a only joke about 36 years, you know, uh, you know. <laughs> but we're getting there, we're getting there. Got the shop now, they got to just buff up the slaughterhouse a little bit. Uh, the harvesting facility, sorry. Um, and um, and uh, keep going. So you end up with all these things. But then we're still very much in the green vegetable business as well. Um, we happen to that greenhouse that you may have noticed coming in the big plastic house over there. That one is where we produce our, our hydro lettuce. Why do we grow hydro lettuce? Because we're the only people. It used to kill me. We'd be like out of the um, lettuce business maybe second week of June, you don't want to go much later because Bermuda had a nasty reputation for bitter lettuce and bitter lettuce is grown simply because it gets a check in growth. And that's it. If you check the growth in lettuce, then it, it um, you take, this, for example, romaine lettuce. If it hasn't had enough water on it, the, I can tell you what's happening at 30 miles an hour from, you know, 500 yards away. It's just, you'll see a different color in the thing and it's useless. So, when does everybody want salad? Like starting about 24th of May. I mean, so the salad business is, is much more in the winter than it ever was. But now it's getting more and more intense. So why, that's the whole reason why we did that hydro greenhouse. So we actually have to work that stuff. We chill our solution, and that is the key to the whole thing. Chilling the solution. As long as the roots are cold or cool, you will get lettuce. i tell you why that chiller blew up last summer, and you think you got a virus within 12 hours. The whole thing just goes wham. Just like, it's astounding. And so then you get all kinds of other, other opportunities. So you got this greenhouse rolling. So we run our nurseries in there and stuff for our outside plants. We get to grow various other things. Um, what we found that the easiest way to produce celery plants and celeriac plants is um, undoubtedly with hydroponics. It's astounding. Your germination goes up by like 80%. We used to double seed every one of them. Now we're back to single seeding again. And the seed is, and we're using pelleted seed so we can handle it. And the viability of that will really drop very quickly because the because of the way it's structured. So um, you find out more and more, which they just don't tell you. So we get to do a lot of things in that greenhouse that we couldn't do outside, and and just I suppose the next things be like micro propagation or something. But I never want to get into all of that just yet. So we've been struggling for the last few years with horrendous weather changes. Don't let anybody kid you. The weather's changing. Tide's coming up. Weather's getting ugly. That's twice now we lost 25,000 strawberry plants, okay? That's a hit. That's a hit. That's, and that's like five grand just worth of plants, right? Just worth of plants. Then you gotta get them in the ground. You gotta work the land up. You gotta put plastic on it. So, you know, I get kicked in the butt twice. I, I need to come up with another plant. So, we came up with another plant. <coughs> we have now, we've put up three of them and they're 200 foot long by 25 foot. It's a, it's a, but they call it a crop shelter. And the beauty of it is, compared to a regular greenhouse, all of the plastics and the coverings and what have you in a regular greenhouse are all clipped in, very rigid. So when a Fabian comes or something, if it's forecast over seven, I used to say, I'll take it now to 85 knots because we change the engineering on the roof of that thing by shortening up plastic lengths and stuff. Um, I, I, would, I won't cut it till 85, but before the rule of thumb was, if it's forecast to grow, go over 70 knots, just cut the roof off. And so you're going to lose everything inside. So you're going to lose all the steel if you leave it on. Case in point was Fabian. We cut our roof off at 5 that morning. These guys simply couldn't get all that plastic off. We were back in business. Okay, we're only working one house. We were back in business in six days. They were six months. These new tunnels that we're working called Haygrove Tunnels are a bunch of hoops, steel hoops. And they're real, they're very clever. Now, all you need to know about Haygrove is you've got to have some faith in these guys when they've got 70,000 hectares covered in plastic, right? These guys, they started as growers, and um, they've really perfected this thing. They, so this is what we've done with these. But we, um, I got lucky, I um, got my sister to write a little story and handed it to BA and got a trip to England the other day. And um, <laughs> that, was, that was very funny, right? And they're talking about they're not paying for this and not paying for that. I said, we're only paying for a hotel in London. I said, well, guess what? I'm not going to London. You know, everybody else is going to London. So went out and checked, went to two places. One was Highgrove, which is um, Charles's place. I went around, they had a pretty interesting day there with the uh, estates manager and the farm manager, David Wilson, and, and, this, and brilliant people, right? Brilliant people. David Wilson's been doing this for about 25 years. So yeah, I think Prince Charles is getting door for sheep like we've got. That was another thing I meant to mention to you. We have gone deep in genetics. Um, the guy who helped me get going on these animals was a guy by the name of Brian Payne. And Brian Payne is one of my better friends. And Brian has a very interesting claim to fame. 
He is the man who was primarily uh, in, responsible for intro introducing the boar goat to North America. Okay? And boar goat has been a huge breakthrough in, um, in meat production, because I don't know if you realize it or not, the most consumed red meat in the world by miles is goat way more than beef because you're looking at all these sub fries just like do you know the most the most um, consumed tropical starch plant is cassava by miles okay by miles you, see, you go to Jamaica you can buy you can buy potato chips but they say you love more cassava chips and so um, anyway so Brian and I are talking away well guess when he went to South Africa to look at these looking at these boar goats and he also went to New Zealand they had them there and he went to those two places, one, because South Africa is so desolate, so barren. These guys are working stocking densities on these sheep of one per 37 hectares, right? Hectares, what, two, well, about two and a half acres? I mean, it's like you find one blade of grass, you got to do a sprint to the next one, which is four miles away. And, and he also went to New Zealand because he wanted to look at that angle because that is the finest pasture in the world. It's naturally, man, it's just beautiful. You know, the, the, every, like, anchor butter and all that stuff, that stuff does not, those, those cattle do not get grain. They don't, they don't have to feed them great. It's all alfalfa because you're working 18% protein and alfalfa, which is better than any dairy ration you can ever get. So he had, so he checked this whole thing out. And then he also, while in South Africa, he got, found another goat that is 10 times better than the boar goat, but he just can't, people aren't getting it yet. He's, he actually owns the registry for that, and that's about to take off because he's just, he's doing a project for Agriculture Canada right now. <laughs> the ranch has discovered that they had 1.8 million acres of acre, and they were Leasing it all out as grazing and stuff is one fundamental problem. Cows won't eat it. <laughs> so so he's, he's working on that thing. And maybe he's going to get it turned. So while he was in South Africa, he um, came across this, these dorpers, these sheep, which is a sheep that we have. And he says, you've got to get them. It's how come? He says, well, any sheep or goat, nine, well, most of them, 90, 95% of them, will only conceive in a decreasing day length. And, you know, they breed in the fall and they lamb or kid in the spring. Dorpera is not daylight sensitive. They will breed at any time of the year. I hurl a lamb. I, I'll tell you what, I moved 10 ewes up there yesterday afternoon. I, he was on it like white on rice. I said, check my boy. And they'll all be bred in three weeks, trust me. You know? And so, so then you get to, so you can schedule your crop and you can actually push them a bit harder. When we first started, we used to get, um, we could get three crops of lambs in two years. So basically every eight months. So basically it's five months gestation, three months to wean, and we're not that hard on them to the day sort of thing. I mean, we'll just do them in batches. And I'll tell you what, two weeks ago, here's from this humble little rangy little dorker flop, we, we weaned 40 lambs, 40 lambs, you know, as, as one crop. And I took another 15 or 20 up there yesterday. So that's encouraging, but there's more things. Okay, they can live anywhere from the equator to the North Pole. They can live on a desert, on the richest pasture in the world, but they shed their hair. Now, what you need to know about sheep is, about 30 years ago, 80% of the sheep in the world were from wool. 20% were from meat. In 30 years, that is completely inverted. Yeah, we all got our fake fleece on and stuff, right? It's killed the wool business. So if, you got, if you're trying to grow meat and you got a sheer sheep, you're not going to make it. That was the bee encounters were rough in them. Prince Charles up about that. I said, well, Papa, I got the answer, man. You got to get some door, but you don't have to clip them. And I think that you're going to do it. You know, so that, that is, is a cool thing. But because they're hair sheep and they shed their wool, there's, um, they win every taste test in the world. Why do they do that? Way less wool. You see, if you got lamb and you got mutton, the difference between lamb and mutton is ba obviously the mutton is older, but it's older and the taste is off because of the lanolin that is produced by the wool that they have. So the more uh, wool you got, the more lanolin is produced, the worse it tastes. These guys are all shedding right now. Hair's about that long. No wool, no lanolin. Even Queen Elizabeth said she, it was among the best lamb she's ever had in her life. So that was pretty clever to spend the money on those genetics, I thought. So we did that, then we did the hog thing, and what we're really finding, if you've got Osaba hogs or Bermuda hogs, they will only throw you a litter, three, maybe four, two or three the first time, and they're pretty stupid. They'll sit on at least one of them. And so we, yeah, they will. You know, it's just the way they're, you know, another, not a lot of candidates for, for Harvard there either. Um, so they get in there. So we, then we, so a friend of Kelly's calls up one. Kelly says, um, yeah, does Tom want another pig? 
how much for the pig? Not what's wrong with the pig? <laughs> the pig is too big to go for a ride in my car. Okay, I'll take it. Right? So, so this was, um, this, and you want to have some fun, you want to load a big pig in the back of a truck and just go a tour on a Saturday afternoon. I mean, there's a lot of people looking at you. Right? So anyway, so we got this, and it was a Duroc, a, a red um, commercial breed of pig. So we started breeding our boar with just with this one, Iggy the big fat piggy. And um, wow, we started getting 13 in a litter. So then we start, so what we've gone back into now is we basically were working, we crossbred, so you got 50, 50% uh, Duroc, 50% Bermuda hog, and then we cut back. So we have no, it's all, they're always three quarter or more Bermuda hog. Why do we insist on that? Because the quality of the meat is just astounding. I mean, the, the, it, it is just astounding, the flavor and everything else, because that's another thing with these pigs. By living on this island, on Asaba Island, um, oddly enough, the biggest shortage of um, food, which this never made sense to me, but this is the way it is, is in the spring, which is just really odd. But they know it's coming. So in the however long they've been there, five, six hundred years, they have adapted, the breed has actually adapted so that they pile on the fat. So you gotta watch them, because you feed them too much. <laughs> they think the spring's coming and not get anything for a month. Boy, they, you know, they eat it all. And so then you get too much fat and it's a nightmare because you know, the fat, well, believe it or not, back fat is actually <laughs> becoming trendy again. Because if you get enough grass and, and in particular grass into all these things, this is another thing I didn't even say anything about. The whole key with pasture poultry and, and, and all this stuff is getting grass in the diet because if you have grass in their diet, it completely changes the lay down of the fats, completely changes it. And so you've got, basically you've got all these fats where, which are completely different. Let's take, say, when well you look at a Purdue chicken or some fat yellow, right? I don't know what, what they put in it. Somebody said they put Oroglo in there and make the eggs. As far as I've seen Oroglo in feed, in, put in egg laying feed to try and yell up the, you know, orange up the yolks. Grass will do it in a heartbeat. Okay, so what you get is a completely different set of fats. I could get into the whole thing, but the easiest way to check it out is, is with this girl, Joanne Robinson, who has a website, eatwild.com, and it's profound. Um, so, Purdue chickens all have yellow fat. Ours is clear. When you cook that turkey at Christmas, how long does it take for that fat to separate? It takes a while, right? Does they tell me? Not around here. It's all separated in about 10 seconds, right? Because of the grass in the diet. That's the key to the whole thing. So what are you winning with this? And you're winning everything. You're growing better food. You're jacking up your land fertility. You're cutting your erosion. It's just like, it, after a while, once you, it's, it's a real difficult plunge to make. But little Fabian would, you know, change her mind pretty quick, right? And, 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 um, and then you get to struggle through. I'm not certified organic. Um, you just, you just got to look at me. Hope I'm not lying. I'm, I'm not a good liar. Okay. <laughs> and so, um, so you. But like you take for example back to Joe Salton. He doesn't even feed organic feed, but he's got the grass in there, and he's the guy who started. And so you can. Some of these guys. I just. I refuse to touch um, big feed mill feed just because I don't trust those guys. Um, so in fact, all of our feed is milled for us by um, this guy, <laughs> Vernon and Elsie Barcoda, 85 Mud Run Road. And you wonder, if you, you wonder why it's called Mud Run Road, just lick up there when it's been raining, right? And um, 